Hello everyone and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is what's new in Dynamics 365 Commerce, February 2023. My name is Tim and I will be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you are agreeing to this experience. The recording will be made available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within the coming weeks. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions during the session in chat and in a brief live segment if there is time after the presentation. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today, we have Microsoft Senior R&D Solution Architects, Febin Chirmel, Pranav Kumar, and Minu Lal. Minu, over to you to get us started. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you guys are joining us from. We're excited to present today's tech talk on topic, what's new in Dynamics 365 Commerce. I'm joined by my colleague, Febin and Pranav. So without further ado, let's get started. We have a big agenda to cover today. We'll try to cover most of the topics which we released recently in Dynamics 365 Commerce. We have divided this tech talk into three subtopics. First, we'll touch base on features related to B2B, B2C, where we'll start with most anticipated feature, Apple Pay with Adyen. And then we'll showcase a product comparison feature on e-commerce site and order on behalf of B2B channel. And we'll hand over to Febin to talk about new feature released in point of sale. He will start by talking how we can directly create or edit purchase order creation from POS itself. And then he'll discuss about the recent improvements which we made in Dynamics Commerce app, like in place upgrades from MPOS to help with help migration of store commerce easily and do a health check directly from POS. After that, we'll hand over to Pranav. He'll focus on exciting new features in call center. He'll start by discussing how he, we can add new rules in distributed order management to prevent order splitting as needed in the certain scenarios. He'll then talk about limit payment token in call center orders and order intent feature for PayPal connector. Let's talk about what is Apple Pay with Adium. Sorry, Apple Pay is a digital wallet payment method which uses Apple Pay Merchant Account. Dynamics 365 Commerce provides support for Apple Pay through native Dynamics 365 Payment Connector for Adyen for both point of sale and the e-commerce checkouts. On supported devices, this functionality saves customer time during a checkout process and enables order review, updates, and payment checkout easily. Like if you have stored the credit card on Apple Pay wallet, you can simply use the button to just pay instead of adding credit card for every single purchase, which makes life easier. Retail customers can also use their Apple Pay devices as a touchless payment option at the POS payment terminal. And just a note, Apple Pay is only visible in Apple Pay devices only. Apple Pay is available from 10.031 without the express version, but it's been available as a normal payment method in, since 10.031. Let's just walk through some of the pre-requests before you dig into a configuration. First thing you need to do is to have an Apple Pay merchant account to use the Apple Pay with Adyen. The documentation of this is well documented in our doc page. We also have provided a link of that in the reference page. Apple Pay must also be integrated with your Adyen account. Adyen can help you get on a set up a payment method and can also help you ensure the correct certificate is in the correct domain to be used. 
And another one is for the commerce headquarters. You need to make sure you have enabled the feature in the feature management called enhanced wallet payment and the payment improvement. After you do that in the headquarter, you want to make sure you have run job 110 to make changes in all channels related to it. All right, let's just see how we can configure our Apple Pay. First, we'll start with the headquarters and then we'll move to a side book, okay? So the very first thing being a pre-request, you want to make sure within our feature management, uh, our wallet payment feature is enabled. So I'll go look for that and make sure it's enabled. So it's already enabled. I now, if it's all, if once it enabled, we'll go to a retail and commerce module and this I'm going to go to channel setup payment methods and then I'll go to card types and I'll add a new card type called Apple Pay. I want to make sure the type is wallet here. After you add it, you'll go to processor mapping. In processor mapping, I'll select Apple Pay. I'll add all those connectors for processor payment, which I want to allow. Like I want to allow a Visa card to be added as Apple Pay and Pay. So I'll go ahead and add it. I've already added it. Uh, and once you do that, you'll click OK here. Close this. And now I've added a card type. I'm going to go ahead and go to online channel. Whichever online channel I want to allow Apple Pay, I have to go add as a payment method. <clears throat> so I'll go to my online channel. I'll go to Fabric and Extended Online Store. And within the payment account, I'll go ahead and add it. First thing, I want to make sure that already the pay, Apple Pay, uh, Microsoft, sorry, Dynamics 365 payment for Adyen is already available. That needs to be our first method here, other way, because that's how the mapping is put set up, right? So make sure that you already had a payment corrector for Adyen set up. After that, you can add any, whether you want to add Google Pay, Apple Pay, PayPal, that uh, there's no sequence to that, but the first one needs to be a Dynamics 365 payment connector for Adyen. So I've added that uh, this is my for Apple Pay and I uh, want to make sure I put a correct cloud API key. This is just a test environment, so I'll add that. The supported currency for me is as of now UST and supported tender type is going to be Apple Pay. After you do that, you're going to go to a payment methods. And you'll add a payment method of Apple Pay here. And uh, this is going to come default. The operation name needs to be a pay card. The connector name needs to be the one we just added, which is Dynamic 365 payment connector for Apple Pay. You'll put your accounts, uh, whichever you want to put. Again, it all depends upon how you want to configure your finances. And if you want to pay it separate, you'll set up a separate account, ledger account for that. And uh, again, this is all depends upon your business scenario. OK, and then I'll click on electronic payment setup. I'll add my ID, which I added at the time of card. OK, so once I add it, I'll save it. This this is setup we need to do at the HQ level. After I finish all the setup, I'll go to my distribution schedule. I'll run a job 1070, which is going to push all the configuration related to channels. Uh, so once it finished uh, available and applied, make sure it's already applied. Then I'll go to my site builder. Within the site builder, the first thing I will do is I'll download the certificate from my Adyen. So there's a setup. Uh, if you go on Docs, it does provide a link to download the certificate. After you download the certificate, make sure you change the extension to TXT. After you change it, you'll click on this URL. You're going to create a new URL. I've already created one. I'll show you that how I did it. So I'm going to go ahead and edit it. The first step you'll select as a media library document and then you'll upload the TXT file. So if you notice this is the TXT file, that's the one I downloaded. So you will upload the TXT file, save it and then publish from here. And then I'll go to my site setting. I'm going to go to extension and content security policy. I'll add this URL since uh, we want to make sure security wise we don't have any issue. So we'll add those. Uh, this URL again is present in our doc articles, so you can copy paste from there and add wherever it says child connect CRC. It does need to add on the frame and image SRC and media. So all those you do it and you'll click on save and publish. 
After you do that, you want to make sure you add the Apple Pay in your checkout fragment. So whichever checkout fragment you're using, you can go to the checkout fragment and edit it. And from here, I'm going to just make it big that way you can see it. I'll add a new module called Apple Pay. Just simply click on it and that would just add it. After you add it, you finish edit and publish it. So that concludes the demo for Apple Pay. Make sure Apple Pay only works on Apple devices, right? So after you do all the configuration, you can test it on any Apple devices and you'll, you should be able to see your Apple Pay button. That concludes the demo for the configuration. Let's check the demo, how the experience look like on the e-commerce site. So the first thing is I'm going to add something in my cart. I've added that already. I'm going to go to my payment methods. If I keep going down, I'll see all my payment methods. I'll see PayPal, Apple Pay. I'm going to click on Apple Pay and it's since I've stored my card and wallet, it's going to show it. Now it's processing. As soon as it's finished processing, I'm, my order will be placed. That's how the whole experience looks like. Now just quickly look at the configuration needed for point of sale for Apple Pay. Point of sale uses a configuration of hardware profile, EFP service field, EFT service field, in Commerce Headquarter, you'll configure the EFT service for Adyen Payment Connector, and you can allow you can allow referred link for the setup. So this is a link you can refer for all the setup that needs to be done. And make sure when you add Apple Pay as a supported tender supported tender type, and you can use a semicolon to separate all those tender types. All right, let's just talk about product comparison feature on B2B or B2C. The product comparison and the product comparison button modules are available as of Dynamics 365's commerce version 10.029 release. It can be used for both business to consumer and business to business websites. Product comparison functionality let shoppers compare product detail on the product comparison page to help them make better purchase decisions. Like you see example on the site. Customer can add products from different categories to a comparison tray, provided products are from the same catalog. So you need to ensure that when you turn on this, make sure the page level caching is disabled for all pages where the product comparison module is used. Let's see how we can configure that on the e-commerce. This functionality is configured in Commerce Site Builder by using a product comparison module, which works like a quick view module. On product list pages, such as category results, search results, and product collection pages, you can configure a button for product comparison that lets shopper add products to a comparison tray. This setup is well documented on our doc site. You can follow step-by-step -step guidance from there. But we want to point out two important things. The first one is currently this feature is shipped with the Adventure Works theme. So if you want to test it out, please change the theme to Adventure Work in the extension page. And you can always extend this theme as needed basis. Another setting we want to highlight is a product comparison limit, which is also available in the extension page within a site builder. It lets you specify the number of product you want to see in the comparison page, and if you keep it blank, there is no limit of products you can compare. Here you can specify a different number of desktop views and the mobile device views as a mobile screen is smaller, so we, you would want to give it a lower value than you would see on the desktop devices. So for optimal browsing experience, we recommend that you set the maximum number of product in the comparison tray to two for the mobile and four for the desktop to reduce amount of horizontal scrolling that is required. Let's have a quick demo of how product comparison feature works. So this feature provide a full flexibility of choosing products from any category, like if I want to buy coats and jacket, or I'm kind of want a sports coat. It's in a different category, so I can choose one product from coats and jacket, the other product from the sports category to add it to a comparison meter window. So as you click, as you see in any new pro any product, you would notice there's a new button added called compare products. As I click on it, you would see there is a pop up. 
window open, which is a preview pop up window. And as I keep on adding product, it will keep on adding product in this comparison window. And right now I have one out of five product added as I as I showed and as I talked about in the last slide that this is fully configurable configurable in the site builder. So this is again, it's a configuration and I can minimize this window and keep if as I keep on adding product, it's going to keep adding to this compare products so I can add a product or if I want to remove a product from this compare list, I can simply click unclick it and I'm going to remove it from there. So as I said, I can choose from the different category. Let me go to another category and choose another different products from there. So I'll go ahead and choose a different category now. And like this one, I want to add and one more I pick as well. So after I add it, you know that I have all the five products and again, it this doesn't have to be all five products to compare. It could be four or three, whatever you want to do, right? So from here, if I want to remove anything for whatever reason, I can simply remove from here or I have a flexibility to clear all the products. After I do that, I can click on compare. Which will open up a compare window. And as I keep looking through it, it will show me a products. It will show me a rating for those product. And I can read through a description and see which one is used for what provide the sizes, cleaning methods and whatnot, right? So I can look at different attributes and compare those products and make up my mind what I want to buy, right? Let's say I want to buy this uh, Western collar jacket. And the good product, good part of this compare window is you can click on quick view from where it's from here itself. You can add it to a cart. Like that concludes the demo for the product configuration. Uh, let's just move to our next topic. Our next topic is let's order on behalf of B2B user. This new functionality will allow B2B account manager to sign on behalf of B2B buyers they work with. Being an account manager, he'll be able to see all the information that buyer sees and take action such as adding item to a cart or placing orders as needed. This is extremely useful when buyer is experiencing difficulty and need an account manager assistant to complete an order. This functionality hasn't been released yet and it's supposed to be released on 10.023. And again, that delivery timelines may subject to change. Let's just walk a quick demo how it works on B2B side. In the next demo, Maria is our store manager who is ordering on behalf of Stephanie, who's a buyer. In order for C1 to sign in as account manager, they proceed to the to the button that is called store manager B2B sign in that is configurable in site builder. Once C1 is signed in, before doing anything else, they have to select a business partner organization. So let's select this first one, Contoso B2B. And on the next screen, they have to select a user that they will represent. Let's select Stephanie. So now we have Maria, a C1, that is working on behalf of Stephanie. Below this bar, all the actions will relate to Stephanie. For example, view accounts will bring us to Stephanie's account. I can review Stephanie's addresses. I can review Stephanie's order history. And so on. So now I can select some products. All pricing and catalogs will come from Stephanie's account. So let's create a new order. What I can see here is delivery will proceed to Stephanie's address. And the only method of payment that should be available is on account payment. Let's apply it and we can place order. Now 
Now, once I'm done, uh, I can now select a different customer. Say Cameron. Or I can sign out from the system. Now, let me quickly demonstrate how this is set up in HQ. For Contoso Retail San Diego customer, we can specify a sales group, which is a group of C1 individuals that are able to place orders on this customer behalf. We add any sales representative here that we want to be allowed to control this customer organization. And as a result of this association, we can, if we review the customer hierarchy that is related to Contoso Retail San Diego, we will notice that now the sales group appears here in this section. This is a read only section. So now any C1 workers that are present in this group 9 and 8, they are able to, to work on behalf of any users that appear in this section of customer hierarchy. This concludes the demo. Thank you. Now I'm going to hand over to Fevin to talk about purchase order creation and edit in from point of sale. Fevin, over Thanks, to you. Yeah. Th thank you. So if we can move to the next slide. Yeah. Thanks. Here we will talk about the improvements released for purchase order management in point of sale. When you manage purchase orders, it goes through different stages, creating the purchase order, editing, approving if you have workflows enabled and confirm the purchase orders. Then you can receive the products listed in the purchase order and register the inventory. Finally, you invoice the purchase order. When it comes to point of sale terminals, in store commerce app, the store uses had very limited set of features for managing the purchase orders. They can only receive the items listed in the purchase orders. So with this new feature, which is released in 1031, we are adding three new functionalities. Create, edit and confirm the purchase orders from store commerce app. Invoicing of the purchase order is still not supported. This need to be handled from headquarters. This new feature is controlled by a feature key called ability to create purchase order request in POS. So you need to go to feature management and enable this new feature key. Once you are done with that, uh, you run uh, vendor master data synchronization to channel database using 1220 CDX job. So what is included in this feature? The store user persona can create purchase order by selecting the approved vendors from the inbound operation screen in a store commerce app. Then you can submit the purchase order. This purchase order will be created in headquarters. While this purchase order is in draft state, you can edit the purchase order. You can, for example, change the vendor or edit or create new lines. Once you are ready to confirm the purchase orders, you can confirm the purchase order from store commerce app itself. There are two new POS permissions added, one for creating the purchase order and another one for confirming the purchase order. By this way, purchase order management can be segregated with different uh, permissions. There are some limitations. Uh, editing and confirmation of purchase order is not supported if change management functionality is enabled in headquarters. So we don't support the workflow in store commerce app. And also the intercompany management is not still supported in store commerce app. So with this, we can see a short demo. Inbound inventory operation is where different actions of purchase orders are managed. From here, you can create a new purchase order request by selecting one of the vendors from whom you want to purchase goods. You can set expected delivery date accounting date and put a note on the header as you want. Next step is to add products to build up the request. 
And for each product, simply enter the product number, specify the quantity you want to purchase from the vendor. If you have barcode scanner device, you can scan the product barcodes to streamline the product entry. When you are done with the product entry, click Submit Request for system to create purchase order record in the back office system. In my environment, I don't have change management workflow enabled, so the newly created purchase order is set to the approved state immediately. Otherwise, the order will go through some manual process to get to the approved state. Now, Checking back in the POS, the newly created purchase order appears in the active tab of the inbound operation and the order number is populated from HQ. You can edit this purchase order by clicking the edit button and make changes in the details view, such as update quantity or add new products into the request. Now, if the vendor on the purchase order header is not an approved vendor for the product being added, you might be alerted with a warning or error message. You can confirm a purchase order directly from POS after all purchase details are settled and committed by the vendor, which sets the purchase order status to confirmed in the back office system and ready for receiving as the next step. Store commerce improvements. Here we will talk about some of the improvements released for, no, uh, you know, yeah. Can you go back? Oh, sorry. Here we will talk about some of the improvements released for store commerce app. As all of you are all of you are aware, the store commerce app migration is the next big milestone. There is a lot of investment going on to help store commerce app migration. We just want to talk about two new features released as part of 10 or 32. The first one is usage of common application data, uh, which is more technical. Another interesting feature is in place upgrade of modern point of sale to store commerce app. When you activate store commerce app, the app data is stored under current user, meaning the activated store commerce app is linked to a Windows user profile. As of today, you need to log in with the dedicated user profile to access the store commerce app. With this new feature, when you install store commerce app, you can provide an optional parameter to use common application data. So as you can see in screen, the old version was storing the app data under user profile. When you install the store commerce app with use common application data parameter, the application data is saved in a common location. It is no longer tied to a specific user. By doing this, the different users in store can log in uh, and uh, use the store commerce app without sharing the user credentials. The, the next one is in place upgrade from modern point of sale. One of the most challenging or time consuming uh, uh, activity in store commerce app migration was to uninstall the modern point of sale and install and activate the new store commerce app in your stores. With this new feature, you can adjust, uh, you can just do an in place upgrade of your modern point of sale to store commerce app. The device token used for modern point of sale will be used to activate the store commerce app in the background and the deployment script will uninstall the modern point of sale uh, without any manual inter intervention. So with this feature, now it is going to be uh, a single step operation uh, when you upgrade modern point of sale uh, to store commerce app. It has full support on mass deployment. So you can incorporate these uh, parameters with your mass deployment script. Now I will show you a quick demo uh, on this. As you can see, I have modern point of sale installed and in use. Now I want to upgrade the modern point of sale to store commerce app. I will install the store commerce app and provide an optional parameter to 
do an in place upgrade from modern point of sale. First, I will close this modern point of sale. Now I will install store commerce app and I will provide this optional parameter to to a in place upgrade from modern POS. The store commerce app is installed in the background and it is activated using the device token from the modern point of sale, which is already in use. And as a final step, the modern point of sale is uninstalled from this system. If you want to keep the modern point of sale, you can skip. There is another parameter. You can uh, read it from the docs article. I will share that in the next uh, uh, slide. Uh, you can skip the uninstallation part. So now you can see the installation of store commerce app is completed. Now you can open the store commerce app. As you can see, there is no prompt for activation. So it is already activated. So after this upgrade, so I can directly log in with my user credentials. And as you can see, the store commerce app is installed uh, and activated. Uh, here I just want to you know reiterate on the documentation part. All the new updates of mass deployment are documented and published in docs article. So you can refer here when you are preparing your mass deployment script and uh, yeah, it is up to date. So here we want to share this news again in this platform regarding store commerce app for iOS. Um, yeah. So store commerce app for iOS is available as of 10 or 31. So you can download the store commerce app for iOS from App Store and you can start using it. This time it is built and supported by Microsoft. Health check improvements in POS. We would like to introduce two new additions in health check functionality. The one is network latency check and uh, retail server connectivity check. These uh, two new features are released as part of 10 or 32. So this is available on store commerce app, cloud post and modern point of sale. So health check feature is not a new one. We had health check feature for hardware peripherals. With the 10 or 32, the store users can now check uh, the network issues from point of sale and report the problems. And that way you have a lot more information with you when you start analyzing these issues uh, reported from the stores. So I will show you a quick demo on this. You can open the health check options from settings. Click on health check. So health check dashboard is visible here or you can add your own link in welcome screen and link it to the health check operation. As you can see, there are many tests listed here. The hardware peripheral related tests are released in previous versions. Now we are interested in the network and connectivity related test. There are two new tests are visible here. One is with the retail server connectivity. Another is with the network latency. So if you go to each test you go to the about screen you can learn more about each test for example if you go to retail server connectivity test uh, you can see that the system will check the retail server connectivity channel database connectivity from point of sale terminal if you go to network latency test for example and uh, you can see that the system is going to check the average network latency between retail server and point of sale terminal now you can run the test together or individually. So I'm going to run it together. So go to the retail server connectivity test and go to the results. 
you can see that the retail server connection is okay the channel database connection is okay and real time service is okay no issues detected everything looks good now if you come to network latency test and uh, go to the result as you can see there is a dashboard which displays the average network latency and uh, from my system the network latency is not that good it uh, fluctuates from 200 to 240 to 50 and so you can see a recommendation based on the latent average latency so in my case the latency is likely degrading your point of sale operation and i am supposed to do some more uh, network tests so that i can get a better latency and i can you know um, fix the problems so your store users can run this test and identify if there are any problems with the network or connectivity okay so now we'll talk about operational insight uh, so this is a old old feature but we want to you know uh, reiterate this again if uh, if you have missed this feature is released uh, with uh, 10.26 uh, so once you have these insights in your control you can you know write your own queries and uh, read the telemetry logs from your app insights yeah you can go to the next slide To configure the operational insights for commerce, first you need to enable the feature key for operational insights. Then you need to set up your own application insight in your Azure account. Once the app insight configuration is complete, as you can see in the screen, you can copy the instrumentation key and set it up against the operational insight tab in your commerce headquarters. Once you complete the headquarters setup, you can run the CDX job to push the changes to channel databases. Now uh, the retail server will start logging the telemetry into App Insights. There is a white paper we published which contain many examples of queries which you can use to uh, query the telemetry from App Insight. For example, measuring the average latency of API calls, detecting the slow queries or hardware related issues. So I have added the white paper link in reference section so you can download that uh, PDF and you know uh, read more. By enabling the operational insight, you can detect the issues earlier. For example, you know the details before your store user call and report an issue. And also you can see a lot more details in App Insight when you receive a complaint from a store user. For example, if they report a slowness, uh, you can you can see whether it is you know sql side issue or network issue you know more details are there with you last but not least you need to be well aware of the cost implications of using app insight it may become very expensive if not managed wisely now i will show you a quick demo on how to retrieve and analyze the telemetry once you complete the operational insights setup you can start playing with app insights just open app insight now, just to check if everything is working fine, run the trace command. So I'll just run the trace. Yeah. Here you can see the retail server API calls and the related information. For example, if you go to custom dimensions, uh, yeah, you can see a lot more information, execution in time, uh, you know, in millisecond, tenant ID, uh, the scale unit region or scale unit details, etc. You can you can also query custom events, so which will tell you when an operation started or finished. Uh, so I will run this custom event. So as you can see, you can see that each event, uh, you know, when it started or finished, this will give you an accurate information. For example, if you want to analyze the performance degradation at all. So here also, just to remember, you can see the custom dimensions where all the uh, retail related information is stored. Now I will just show you how you can relate your POS with App Insight. Once you log into POS, go to settings. Here you can see app session ID, user session ID, device record ID. You also know your timestamp. 
all this information is very important if you want to correlate uh, your post uh, activities with app insight so here i will copy this app session id and i will go back to app insight as you can see i am now filtering my pos terminal events so i'll just run this so you can see these uh, details are retrieved from my pos now i will run another query which will give you information about the performance of the checkout operations so here i have hard coded my environment id then i hard coded the uh, checkout api name now i will run this so there is a spike you can see the result set so it is coming average 500 to 600 uh, millisecond uh, for the checkout operation now uh, if you want to filter it out for your uh, your pos i will just copy this line i just paste it here and you run it for your pos so if you go to the result set you can see that there are two checkout in last 24 hours from my pos and you know the latency for the checkout operation hope this helps uh, now we'll move to the next uh, part okay thank you so now i will hand over to pranav uh, to talk about uh, dom improvements and call center improvements okay uh, thank you Fabian. hello everyone i'm going to talk about uh, next few topics the first one is related to prevent order splitting when order is brokered through dom okay so uh, let's understand uh, some scenarios as well here um as we know like dom engine supports partial order rule wherein an order can be split at order level or at line level but in current partial order rule framework dom does not consider order value for example if there is a sales order uh, with a total of say dollar 200 and if that order is brokered to be fulfilled from three different fulfillment location then that order may not be profitable you know because of the freight cost similarly there might be business requirement wherein if certain product is on a sales order then that order should not be split by dom so in order to address this scenarios we released a new feature in dom called prevent order splitting by dom based on order value or included products in this the partial order rule is enhanced and have additional configuration to allow user to define an order total threshold and list of project products which will drive whether a sales order should be split or not dom engine uh, would prevent order splitting if the order total is below the defined threshold or if the sales order you know like has the item that we are defining in the rule that should prevent the order splitting So uh, for the new feature to take effect, you will first need to enable feature uh, product uh, prevent order uh, splitting by Tom based on order value and included products. So um, as you can see in the screenshot also uh, from the feature management section. So if for some reason the feature is not showing up, make sure you have clicked check for updates on the top right. Once you uh, enable now click on the enable now the set functionality will get activated uh, please note that uh, this feature is released as part of 10.0.31 so make sure that you are on latest version uh, to use or test this feature now let, let's uh, take a look at the rule what the changes on the rule side um, in this slide i'm showcasing uh, the partial order rule configuration with and without feature enabled like uh, let's pay a little bit attention on the two screenshots that i've highlighted here the left screenshot uh, shows partial order rule without the prevent order splitting feature you know the one that uh, is in the production if you are using now uh, in this 
Notice that uh, primarily the max fulfilling locations can be defined along with whether the order can be split at order level or at line level. So the existing behavior, you don't have much to configurations, uh, you know, like uh, on the partial order rule. Now on the right screenshot, notice that there is a field for sales order total and lines total in addition to the partial order rule. I have highlighted those um, uh, in the red boxes. The sales total amount, uh, you know, is a threshold amount here. So as per the rule defined in the screenshot, the sales order which has a value of up to 200 will not be split. Uh, if the sales order is greater than $200, then the order can be considered for a splitting, but uh, please notice that uh, we have defined maximum fulfillment location as two. So the order will be split uh, into maximum two fulfillment location. OK, uh, I will also like to call out that uh, when this feature is enabled and when you are specifying the sales uh, total amount and max fulfilling location, then the fulfilled partial location and fulfilled partial lines will be set to false and you can't override it. So this is one scenario that I wanted to highlight where we have defined the uh, sales total amount. Another scenario in this rule is the lines section, if you notice. If you define any category or item here, then in that case, if the sales order contains item that has been specified in this rule, notice fashion categories is specified, then the sales order will not split. The rule is, this rule basically uh, for scenarios where certain items on SO should not be shipped from two different warehouses. Uh, we have seen many business requirements where there are two items, like one is related to personalization, so or you know exports and item and its accessories so those should be shipped together so those are the scenarios from where we are coming with for this rule now once again like i would like to highlight uh, the configuration once again like sales total amount is 200 dollars and lines has a category of fashion because my next slide i'm going to use this configuration as an example okay so in this uh, uh, scenario like uh, um you know like i'm trying to explain uh, let's understand actually so first we should see the setup like i have th three different warehouses uh, in the system anapol anabro and uh, atlanta and i have four different items 0012 0013 0014 and 0001 and for each of these uh, warehouses slash stores i have uh, set up inventory quantity as two so for example, like 0012 in Anapol has an inventory of two. Similarly, for uh, other three items that I've listed. So uh, for the sake of simplicity, I just put up a scenario here. I have created four different uh, sales order. And let's try to understand with regard to the previous rule, when the DOM will uh, run, what will happen to the order? So first order, you will notice that, uh, you know, there is a three items of 0012 and in my sales order the total sales order value was 179.97 now remember in the rule we have defined the sales total amount as 200 dollars so when we run dom in this case um, the order will not split because it it considers the uh, sales order total amount the threshold amount which is not matching so and since the quantity is three and we don't have three quantity in any one warehouse, the order will not be split. And, you know, like the order will not, the expectation is it will not be fulfilled. Uh, the second order 012577, uh, in this you will notice that uh, the sales order has three quantity of item 0013 and uh, the order total is 449.97. So this particular sales order passes the sales order threshold, which is, uh, $200 in our case. And since the quantity is two, it can be fulfilled from two different warehouses. And that is also in our setup that we have defined in the max order rule. So this order will get fulfilled. Um, the third order is like uh, 012578. In this, like we have five items of 0014. If we look at the inventory on hand, like, uh, you know, like uh, for 0014 to be fulfilled, we need at least three different warehouses because each warehouse has uh, inventory of two. So, and we have defined two split locations, right? So in that case, since two location does not have uh, the sufficient inventory, so 
uh, the order will not be fulfilled. And uh, the last scenario is like uh, three items with 0013 and one item of 001. The order total is 519, though it surpasses the order threshold. But uh, I want to call out that item 0001, it belongs to the category that I have defined in my uh, in the partial order rule. Since the item is in that category, when we run the DOM, uh, it will not split. Uh, simply because we have defined uh, the category on the uh, partial order rule. OK, um, for the implementation consideration, I want to call out that, uh, uh, you know, like the partial order rule is still in the production. And uh, when you enable this new feature, the old partial order rule feature gets deprecated and new ones takes effect. And uh, when you run the DOM, again after enabling the feature then the new rule will come into effect so uh, make sure that uh, you know like you are going through especially for the customers who are in production that uh, you test in the test environment first thoroughly and you understand every behavior of it and before you making any before you make any changes to production So next topic I wanted to cover is related to limiting uh, payment token usage for call center orders. Uh, for this one also, let's try to first understand uh, you know, the background of where we are coming from. Uh, in the current scenario, if you are using call center, uh, when you create a order, um, you know, like uh, from the call center module, and when you enter the credit card details, uh, for the payment on the order and you submit it. The credit card uh, token information is saved. OK, so by save, what it means is. Um, 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 you, you know, like uh, if we can uh, move forward a little bit. Uh, if you when, when the user creates the call center agents creates the new sales order, OK, then um, uh, then like the previously used credit card of that customer, you can see in the drop down. So in, in the screenshot, if you see like uh, in the previous before uh, taking this a screenshot, like we created a sales order for the customer. And this is a sales order number two. In the sales order number two, when we are coming to this screen and clicking on the drop down, we can use the payment, uh, cre the credit card information that was previously used. Um, so user creating the sales order does not have control to drive this behavior at the time of order entry, like uh, save credit card for file, you know, like. Uh, well, so by default, the system well, is saving the credit card information. Now, please note that uh, the screenshots that I'm showcasing here is from a day one environment which has RDM uh, configured. So uh, the I wanted to uh, call this out that uh, the screenshots are from RDNS environment. OK. Um, so starting 10.0.30, a new feature called restrict payment token usage uh, to order context is available. Uh, when you when this feature is enabled, the call center agents uh, will have ability to save the card for future use or not as per customer's direction. The feature needs to be enabled from the feature management workspace before you can use it. So what happens uh, when you enable this feature? Uh, once a feature is enabled, when you create a new order on the payments form where you collect the customer credit card information, you will see a new option called save payment information as highlighted in the screenshot in yellow color here. If you don't explicitly select this checkbox on the order entry, the credit card information will not be available as drop down for future orders. In the screenshot that is on the right, you will notice that the credit card information is showing in drop down, right? Uh, the credit card information is not showing on the drop down. Sorry for that. Uh, call center agents will have to re enter the credit card again, uh, the credit card information again for the order to complete. Okay, so this is the behavior change, right? I mean, earlier the credit card was showing up, but now it is not showing up. Um, so some implementation consideration we want to call out uh, for the projects which are in analysis and design phase. Uh, consider the scenario as demo scenario in CRPs or whenever you're doing system in uh, to the customers. Uh, 
end customers. Uh, second thing is that these payment tokens that were created before the restrict payment token usage to order context feature was flag was enabled will remain as code. And this is uh, basically this point is for the customers who are already live uh, in D365 commerce. So for these tokens, they can be removed on a regular basis in commerce headquarter using either the you know you can use the archive credit card transaction data batch job and you can use the purge credit card tokens functionalities uh, you know like to get rid of old tokens okay so now let's talk about another important feature uh, called order intent feature for paypal payment connector uh, in this one also let's try to understand what the current business scenario is and what we are solving um, in the current scenario like PayPal authorization expiry. So orders, uh, as you know, the PayPal is supported by D365 Commerce primarily for e-commerce checkouts. In the existing uh, PayPal connector, the PayPal authorization will expire automatically in 30 days. And uh, once the authorization expires, the order will fall into do not process the state and end customer must be contacted uh, to arrange for the alternate ways uh, of order payment. Now, this can be a problematic scenarios where retailers is having a higher fulfillment turnaround time or if they have a substantial back orders in their system, which can create further delays. And uh, please note uh, the day is like 30 days um, for the authorization expire. Okay. So starting 10.0.30, uh, the PayPal payment connector with uh, con connector has a new functionality called order intent. You will notice uh, the order intent on payment service form or uh, on the online store form. And uh, the new order intent field has two values, uh, authorize and save. Uh, in my screenshots, I'm highlighting the payment services and online screen uh, online store form. So what does this do? The default value of order intent field is authorized. When the order intent is set up as authorized, it will work as per the current behavior, which means the authorization will expire in 30 days and you won't be able to reauthorize beyond 30 days. Now, when the order intent is set up as save, the limitation of 30 days can be overcome. Uh, now, like uh, I think the default setup with PayPal is 30 days, so you can work with PayPal to extend the period of authorization expiry to something that suits your business. So if you are already using PayPal in production, you can switch to save from authorize, like in 10.0.30, you will notice that it is authorized, but you can change it to save. And in this case, the old PayPal order will still carry the authorization days limit that you have of the 30 days, but the new order will leverage the save functionality if you are changing the configuration. Now, so the PayPal orders from previous will, will be there before changing the configuration to the new one, and both orders can be invoiced without any, without any problem, but uh, it uh, but the how you change the configuration of order intent, uh, you know, it drives the behavior of new sales orders that will get created. Okay. Um, so that was it from my side on the PayPal. Uh, what we have done here is like uh, we have some reference materials that you can go through for more in-depth learning. As you might know, we constantly update our learn site based on the new feature releases or if, if, if there is anything. So we listed all the important reference materials here. Okay. I think uh, we can take some questions and answers. So, so like uh, I can take few. I think few have already ordered. So the first question: Do we have any option? Uh, order lines will split based on courier services. At this moment, uh, we don't have that. Uh, where like the order split can be based on courier services. Um, what I would recommend is like, uh, please, uh, you know, like if you have some important business uh, scenarios for Tom, log into ideas portal. And, um, you know, we can consider that in the future releases. Um, 
Mm -hmm. So another question is uh, from Camelo. If prevent order splitting feature is enabled, okay, I can still set it to not be used. It depends on the configuration, right? So uh, when you enable this new feature, it will change the behavior of existing uh, partial order rule. Um, you know, DOM is like highly configurable, right? You can still create the fulfill uh, uh, partial order rule, but if you're not using that in the fulfillment profile, um, you know, like if you're not using that in the fulfillment profile, then that rule will not affect any brokering. Um, like uh, any other questions? Yeah, I think like there might be a few follow up questions uh, there which we can answer offline. Um, so thank you everyone for your participation. We hope it was a productive session. Uh, Tim, over to you. Thank you, Pranav. I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We'd love to hear your feedback on today's session and hear what you'd like to see in future events. Thank you in advance for your participation. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be made available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within the coming weeks. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters today and to you, our audience, for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of the day ahead.